Well, welcome everyone. I'm going to get us rolling right on time because I know that uh, probably uh, like you, I'm eager to soak up every moment that we can with this terrific alum um, in a room of terrific alums. So to all of you who are alumni, maybe that's all of you, at least based on your attire or your name tags, welcome home. Welcome back to campus. We love every opportunity that we get to welcome you back and to continue the, to get to know you. Um, on that note, um, some of you may have been ones who RSVP'd for this event. If so, we actually like to know that you came and uh, because we so enjoy being in communication and contact with you, um, we ask that you take a moment as we sort of pass this around. Um, I'll start with one on this side. I'm in teacher mode here. Okay. And one over here that can kind of circulate around. Let us know if there's any info missing. We love hearing about you and everything that you're up to. Um, and of course, I want to give a particularly warm welcome to the class of 1969 for your 50th, uh, for your 50th, for your 50th, for I think that that's really exciting. I should introduce myself. Um, I am, I'm Megan Burke. I'm a sociology professor here, and I'm the chair of sociology and anthropology. And it's my distinct pleasure to, uh, to welcome and to introduce Harry Human. Um, who is going to talk to us today about, uh, about his, his life work um, and his life experiences um, with Holocaust, these, these stories of survival. Uh, Harry Human is the child of parents who were survivors of the Holocaust. In addition to his parents, the only other survivors were one grandparent, an aunt, and an uncle. Subsequent to his father's liberation from Dhaka and his mother's liberation from Auschwitz, Harry was born in a displaced person's camp. Southern Germany. Harry is active in Rotary, serving many club and district positions. He was selected to be a team leader for a group study exchange to Australia in 2006 and is a graduate of the Rotary Leadership Institute. Harry has served many years on the board of directors of the Florida Holocaust Museum, Hillsboro Achievement Resources Center, and is a graduate of Leadership Hillsboro. He's both a docent and a speaker at the Florida Holocaust Museum and regularly presents information about the Holocaust, about his family's history and anti-Semitism to grades six through 12. Harry also does these presentations at universities, including he came to the Modern Germany class um, on Wednesday and also spoke to our religiosity group of students who have interfaith conversations. And I wasn't able to be there, but I heard that they were just so deeply impacted by you sharing your story and talking about your work, and, and we're so grateful that you um, have connected with our students here already this week in those ways. Harry retired in June 2012 from the Hillsborough, Hillsborough County's Planning and Growth Management Department with 29 years of service in various managerial and executive positions. He also has 15 years of experience, of uh, professional experience in other jurisdictions throughout the country. He's authored many public documents and has been published through an international Entity. Harry has a bachelor's in sociology from Illinois Wesleyan University and, <laughs> and uh, a master of urban a master's of urban and regional planning summa cum laude from Texas A&M University College of Architecture. Subsequent to his retirement, he, he established H3 Development Solutions Incorporated to guide others through the amazing maze of governmental and land development regulations. I believe you. <laughs> Harry resides in St. Petersburg, Florida. He has two children and six grandchildren. I have been pleased to get to know him lately for many reasons, but in part because he enjoys travel, outdoor activities, different eateries, craft beers and wine, reading, those are all of my favorite things too. And of course his grandchildren, who I'm sure I would love if I met them. Please get, help me give a warm welcome to Harry Hewitt. Anecdotally, I was uh, speaking with one of our lone fellow classmate guy. Last time I flew into, or flew out of, whichever way you want to look at it, uh, Bloomington Airport with DC-3s. Uh, Some of us remember that. Yeah. And when they land, they take out like a nosedive, yeah. and you can get to see the, through the pilot's window. <laughs> you know, just, and they give a basket of chiplets. <laughs> tears one top. Tears. But yeah, I'm that young. <laughs> <laughs> I have a lot of life yet in front of me. Yes, as you heard, the um, uh, part of my family's story that I only began to uh, really understand that it would be impactful to 
the whole community, any community, any age group, is uh, I started about 25 years ago speaking to the middle schools and high schools. As one of the founding members of the Florida Holocaust Museum, and oh, by the way, I'm not giving a pitch for it, but when you're in St. Petersburg, Florida, there's brochures outside. Um, and for a smile, a handshake, and a bottle of water, I'll gladly be a dose of you or anyone else there. And I have a picture of one of the, one of the pictures that we'll be seeing here is something from my, from my family. So I've given everything from my family to the all of this. It's better for the world you know, than collecting dust on, on the shelf or, or in, the, in the closet. So given that my time is short, because I like to talk, there's so much to talk about, there's no question I'm going to leave time for um, Q&A, and there's no question that I will not answer. I have some unique questions asked of me at the religiosity, and I just responded. It was the first time in the revelation to me that I would respond like that. So life is good. We all know about the Holocaust. A little bit about the history. You are now a witness to a witness. Usually one will say at least six steps removed from knowing a neighbor or relative, classmate, whatever, but now I'm a witness to my parents when they finally told me their story in 1960. I was 14 years old. And then my sisters were 11 years old. My sisters are identical twins, double trouble, as a sibling. <laughs> um, and uh, so you're just two, uh, you're two steps removed. Some of the things that I present is very similar. This is an annotated presentation, because I have a rotary presentation, 20 minutes. I have an hour and a half presentation and many presentations in, in between. Is uh, I speak primarily to middle schoolers and high schoolers, so think as you're looking at this. But it's ageless. What I'm presenting is ageless. We have part choice to be an upstander, a bystander, a perpetrator, or a victim. I know I have been an upstander. I know I have not been a bystander. I've been accused as a side note of on graduation here and, and I got the wings were fluttering quite well. I was and still am in a way a civil disobedient, emphasis on civil. Mm -hmm. I don't think there's a courthouse in the country uh, that has a record for me, but I will say what has to be said whenever it has to be said. I know I've never been a perpetrator, but I haven't been a bit, I've been a victim. Anti-Semitism on me. Anti-Semitism on my children. When they were in uh, middle school uh, and in our neighborhood in, in the 80s, in uh, north, north side of Tampa, Florida. What you see here is something that's really applicable to any religion, but I'm obviously focused on Judaism here is that any religion, especially Judaism, is not a nationality, it's not a culture, it's not a race. There could be different nationalities, can be different cultures, can be different races. Like the Asian Indian, the people in, who live in the wonderful country of India. Large historical Jewish population there. And the same one can say for many other religions in the world, whether they be considered major religions or minor religions, whatever you want to say. But we have to remember that a religion, in my opinion, and in my readings, in my communication with people, is a standalone. So who would want to share with me what they see? The picture on the left is one of the pictures we have in our, at our museum. What's going on in that picture? I believe in participation. It's a derogatory picture of a Jewish person. Yeah, maybe they look like they're evil, they're not evil, right. they're just right. kind of Anybody else? Taking over the world. Taking over the world? Anybody else? Somebody's yeah. hanging on to their life. Yeah, and you see, and, and one can one can see at the bottom, people, type of thing. And no offense to the people who have volunteered here, but how do we know this person is here? The Norse. Well, don't people from Greece have the strong facial features, or the people from Italy? or from other countries. And this is what happens, and, and these slides, I put three slides into one, because this is my abbreviated presentation. I tried to lead into it. But as you can read there about the concept of profiling that then leads into anti-Semitism, or anti-anything. Yes? What does it say? Um, the Pearl of the Jews in French. So 
So Germany, these are actual black and white photos. In our museum, we have just black and white photos. Black and white photography is awesome. Um, we know the history, World War I occurred, World War I ended in 1918, the Treaty of Versailles was signed. The United States was not a signatory. You know, I always presume that was not a signatory to the Treaty of Versailles. Germany was told a lot of things they could not do. No one likes, or a country doesn't like to be told what we cannot do, type, type of scenario. And they also had to pay reparations. So they were hurting. And, but yet the people did not care when they went to the butcher shop. The slice of meat they got, the piece of meat they got, as long as it was a good price and it was good meat. Same thing with a bakery. Had a good loaf of bread. Breakfast rolls, whatever the case may be. People did not care what religion the proprietor was. And we don't care today. 1929, we know what happened Happened historically, 11 years after the end of World War I. Information transfers much slower at that time, not like nanoseconds today. And, and the people began to become unhappy. A person by the name of Adolf Hitler <coughs> rose to power as a wonderful orator, and he began to speak about the things he liked and about the things he did not like. And as any good orator does, they're able to convince people. You see it time and for night on throughout the history of the world. <coughs> this, and these are actual pictures I should share with you. These are actual pictures that either survivors to our museum, which are getting fewer and fewer, just due to arithmetic, uh, or refugees were able to, um, to bring out to the, out of their their homeland. Picture of crystal knot. Somebody has heard of crystal knot. Night of the broken glass. I, I believe it was November seventh, nineteen thirty eight. A Nazi, a young Nazi embassy official in Paris, France, was killed. Goebbels, who was a propaganda minister for the Nazis, decided that what a wonderful opportunity. Let's blame the Jews. No evidence. No documentation, no nothing. On November 8th and 9th, almost every Jewish business that the Nazis could find or the neighborhood could find that was either owned or managed uh, by a Jewish person was destroyed in Germany, in Sudanland, of uh, um, uh, Czechoslovakia at the time, Austria, and many other countries. And over 600 synagogues were burned to the ground. 600 synagogues were burned to the ground. And the Nazis then forced the Jewish community to pay for the cleanup of the synagogues. All part of history. All part of history. You, know, you shake our heads and wonder. And as I'm presenting today, think of what's going on in the world today. And I am you upon invariably the younger generation. There could be some in this room, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> that when your time comes, register to vote, have your voice heard. Very, very, very important. Many people living in other countries, as we know, don't have that, don't have that opportunity. But you see what's going on with this lady right here, walking in front of the store, just trying to avoid looking. We've probably been all in that position. And the poor child or grandchild, I'm not sure which, is probably one still slower. First of all, the feet don't go as fast as the adult. Uh, we're all grand have been or no grandparents or aunts and uncles, we younger younger ones, you know, the little feet sometimes we, we, we carry them through the air. But he's interested. So that's what happened. This is part of a true story. One of the many stories my parents finally told me was in uh, when the crystal knock happened, my grandfather, my mother's father, who did survive the war because he was able to get a visa and land. Uh, in Havana, Cuba, a couple months before the MS St. Louis issue happened. Um, and uh, she was sweeping up the glass in front of one of his stores, jewelry stores. And every time the dustpan was reasonably full, the Nazis who were standing around and tormenting people that were cleaning up would, would kick it, dump it. And mom would keep doing it again because it was important in that culture 
to clean up the outside almost before you did the inside, the respect of others. Very German type of culture. Um, that, she was very stubborn, I admit to, inheriting that. <laughs> the photograph on the right is an actual photograph of some Nazi health professional measuring the forehead potentially the girth of one's nose to determine whether someone would live or die. Profiling. And they put into, into a science which they evolved to the term that was around for a while was known as eugenics. The, we have other photographs, you know, you know, similar to that that shows profiling and relates to the picture I showed you in the first picture I shared with you. The second largest religious group to be persecuted during the Holocaust is Jehovah's Witness, a sect of Christianity, as we all know. And the reason why, the reason why is that they stood tall. They would not sign a declaration that says they would forsake their belief system and follow the Nazis. Germans are good record keepers. I still have a lot of paper in my copy on this. Um, but we have their documentation of over 25,000 people who perished because they refused to sign. They stood tall. But even people that did, they had to wear a violet triangle. Like the Jews, as you, as, as you I'm not used to a mic. <laughs> Sorry. Um, just as the Jews had to wear a Star of David, as my parents had to wear a Star of David, um, and other relatives, I only know vicariously. Those witnesses have more profile. They dehumanized, controlled. When they were at the grocery store, at the park, or wherever. Homosexuals had to wear a pink triangle. The most of homosexual, both men and women, were considered Aryan. Relatively tall, statuesque, blonde hair, blue eyes. I had blonde hair once upon a time. I may remember that. <laughs> um, but they were not really persecuted for being homosexual. They were put into their own little ghetto with a small G, their own neighborhood, and they sort of stuck together. But there's a backstory. We had an exhibit at our museum, and our <coughs> museum uses education, culture, and history to talk about the vicissitudes and, and the whereas and the why, wherefores of, of the Holocaust so we can learn, learn from them. And it was an exhibit, Dr. Erickson from Miami <coughs> University in Ohio, where I spoke at last year. Um, curated this exhibit on the homosexuals during the Nazi era. And he uh, shared with us some interesting facts, and I'll just share one of these facts, is that the Nazis trained the homosexual men to be soldiers. Brigades upon brigades and brigades, thousands and thousands. These were the same soldiers that were the first line lines upon the invasion of Russia. Rhetorically speaking, or critical thinking, whatever you want to call it. So the question can be said, did the war kill these men? Or did the Nazis kill these men? Is something like this going on in the world today? And what should the world do about it? Or could do about it? Roma Sinti, gypsies, Romanian Hungary. They were uncontrolled lot of people. Lot of people, not many, but you know, a group of people. Uh, they had to wear a brown triangle. They were profiled, the humanized control. The Poles had to wear a red triangle. And Poland and Germany historically usually did not get along well, and I think that's sort of valid in the way today. Um, and remember that thought because I have another slide that this is going to relate to. And rumor is is that they had the P, the black P and the red, because if you're colorblind, you don't see red or greens. I don't know if we have documentation on that, but that's that's what we read. This is a boxcar. One of the four boxcars that four or five boxcars that exist in North America. And by the way, our Florida Holocaust Museum is the fourth largest Holocaust Museum in North America. It's in Creekwood, Florida. Fourteen feet by forty feet. Fourteen feet by forty feet. Used obviously to Moved cattle initially, previous to World War One. During World War One, there was about a dozen horses in there, or about 20 soldiers. 
trees, 14 feet by 40 feet. In reality, 80 to 100 people. No air conditioning, no ventilation. There's some louvers on the, in the corners. No bathrooms, no seats, just people. Treated worse than cattle or horses. Our museum does not keep the doors open that you can walk through, as I think you can in Skokie or you can in Washington, D.C. at the Holocaust Memorial Museum. Out of respect to the people that did. Family members, I only know vicariously. Um, when we clean the inside, or I should say, when people rode in these cars of all ages, babies to people, let's say, in my age group, um, you went everywhere, you had a natural priority, you did it standing up, all the way to if you died, you did it standing up. You were just body to body to body. But we do have on exhibit, right down here, when we, got the, when we received this boxcar 17, 18 years ago, we cleaned out the inside. It was quite musty, as you can imagine. Thank goodness to a benefactor who arranged not just to only buy it, but transport it from Poland to downtown uh, Petersburg. Um, and we know this ring, we found a ring. It was the size of a ring of a preteen girl, 10, 11 year old girl, probably. And we put that ring on display just so people can think why did this girl take it? off her most precious piece of jewelry or her only piece of jewelry, push it between two floorboards. Do you think she would find it again? Did you want did she not want the Nazis to have it? Did she want to leave it for some other girl? We will never know. We don't know, even know who it is. It's irrelevant. It's the poignancy of that history. The photographs we see in the back are primarily from refugees. Thanks goodness the Allied bombings the type of bombing different than today, where you can you can hit a postage stamp a thousand postage stamp a thousand miles away. There, there, there's some of us know a lot of us know a blanket bomb from the bombers. I don't have any photographs. My parents don't have any. Didn't survive. So again, when I said vicariously about relatives, I'm talking. You know, it's the reality. Couple pictures here. Top left. It shows. Most concentration camps, work camps, our bike not cry, work will make you free, fallacy. <laughs> On the right, we have a picture of 15 men, 15 men that were delegated by Adolf Hitler and his cronies uh, to come up with a decision on how they can kill more people, primarily Jews, faster. That was their mission. It was in the Wannsee Conference in 19, January 1942, I think January 20th of 1942. And these 15 men allocated at a resort. Wannsee is a, is a resort community outside of Berlin, Germany. And they were allocated three days in 89 minutes. Germans are good record keepers. 89 minutes, they came up with the Saigon gas. They came up with the idea of killing centers. I'll talk about that in more moments. But I want to go back to these 15 men. The top middle person, Ada Weichmann. I mentioned earlier that uh, I only found out about the Holocaust when I was 14 years old, 1960. That's when he was captured in Argentina. And my parents, who decided they did not want to live in a big city. They didn't want to go to Boston, Philadelphia, Chicago, New York, wherever. We moved into a rural area of upstate New York, south of Rochester, New York. Beautiful country, a whole lot of snow. Um, but they moved there to escape, to escape. The size of the community was, I'll give you two examples. Rush hours when the school buses went underneath yellow flashing light. <laughs> and the school had, from kindergarten to 12th grade, less than a thousand students. All right, that was a very rural community. My father was a physician. He studied again for licensures here in this country. He became what many of us in this room may remember, a general practitioner, a country doctor. House calls, you know, unheard of except by the computer these days, or whatever. Um, Adolf Eichmann, 
at his trial, and he was, by the way, he was the only person that died by capital punishment by hanging in Israel in 1962. They passed a special law, whatever it was, in the Knesset, that this person was going to die by hanging because Israel doesn't have capital punishment. But one thing that Eichmann said, in paraphrasing here at his trial, he said, no, I know I've been involved with the transportation of primarily Romanians and Hung uh, people from Hungary, uh, over 800,000, but I've been involved for the deaths of about one and a half million people. And if, a, if I was involved with one and a half million more people, that would not have been enough. Mm -hmm. And I'm paraphrasing. Mm -hmm. That's the thinking. That's the way it was. The other unique feature here is the average IQ. Average means some higher, some lower, obviously. The average IQ was in the upper 130s. I say that because some of us, a lot of us know, when you get to that level, you're, you're quite intelligent. But when, primarily when I speak to students, I share that in, because someone is intelligent doesn't mean they're smart. Two different things. Black on glass. Thoughts about that? Somebody know what company, international company, <coughs> that still exists today? <coughs> manufactured as Icon Gas? Bayer Pharmaceuticals. So does that mean that I should tell my physicians, I've more than one, as many of us do, um, not prescribe anything from Bayer Asthma, should I fault the grandchildren? Should I not buy a Ford vehicle because Henry Ford supported Adolf Hitler financially? Firestone, same thing. And yes, I've bought Firestone tires. And yes, I've had prescriptions that were made by Bayer. And yes, I once in my life I had a Ford vehicle. And that's okay, I don't blame. But there's some people primarily from Germany who are children or grandchildren, they have literally divorced their parents when they found out one or both of them were Nazis. They went to that extreme. What's going on in the world today? How should people think or act? Let's, let's focus in on the percentage of Jews in Germany in the early 30s. It's just an estimate. What percent? Who's the one to volunteer? What percentage? 27. 27. 11. 11. One percent of the total population were of the Jewish faith, were Jews. And no, we had, there's no documentation that has withstood, uh, withstood the test of time and research that Hitler was, had any family members who were Jewish. Hitler was never elected to any position. It's sort of like when you volunteer a great idea at church or an organization meeting or whatever, and they say, you're in charge of the committee. And they kept moving, they moved people up. That's the way it was. Now the yellow dots you see there is not reflective of the hundreds, the four or five hundred concentration work camps, transit centers that existed in Europe during the Nazi era. If it was, the whole central part of that map would be all in yellow. But I showed this map for the simple reason to show these were, were the six killing centers that were built. Auschwitz, Auschwitz, Treblinka, Kinglo, Belzac, Pajanek. And this is where my mother was liberated from, Auschwitz. And this is where my father was liberated from, Dachau. I should say they were married in 1940, April 18th of 1940, in spite or despite the craziness of what's going on in Europe, in their own country. They were married in, 19, in uh, Berlin, Germany, in 1940. They were together for about two years, and then they were separated about two and a half to three years. There's a whole history related to how they found each other, a whole serendipity story about how they found each other. But remember I mentioned to you, well, what's unique about the location of the Red Dots, geographically speaking? They're all homeless. Uh, share with you earlier that Poland and Germany didn't. All right, they didn't want, even though there were killings throughout Central Europe. 
and crematorium throughout Central Europe. My father, as a physician, and as we know, physicians take uh, an oath, Hippocratic oath. All right, you should do no harm. But one of the ways my father survived, one of the ways my father survived was to be follow orders. And one of the orders he had at one of the camps was he had to be involved with putting both living and dead people in crematorium. He decided to live and win. My mother in Auschwitz was placed in a special, what's called a sub camp. And she was a very beautiful lady. I'm biased. What can I say? <laughs> but I say that because she was not tattooed. She was not tattooed because she spent many months in a brothel by the Nazi soldiers. But she decided to do whatever um, and survive and then win. Some of the people in the room may have heard of a book, Man's Search for Meaning, by Dr. Victor Frankel, the book on logotherapy, what allows people to survive an atrocity, let's say. Uh, for those of you that have read the book, the book's on iTunes, uh, Kindle, at Barnes & Noble, etc. It's a fast, sorry? Title again. The Man's Search for Meaning by Dr. Victor, D-I-K-T-O-R, Frankel. And those of you that nodded yes or may have read the book or whatnot, um, when in the middle of the book he talks, Dr. Frankel, a psychiatrist neurologist, talks about a, a bunkmate, a fellow physician, uh, that helped him survive. And my father in Germany was a psychiatrist neurologist, and that was my father that Dr. Frankel was talking about. Mm -hmm. And that book is still, still valid today. I read it every once in a while. I give a perspective of what's going on in the world today. These are tiles on one of our walls on, uh, on the third floor done by eighth graders. Quickly showing what they, what the Nazi symbol and moving it around to the peace symbol that we all, many of us remember from the 60s or the 70s. I've got the set up here. Um, simple thing with a butterfly and never forget. Somebody know the history of the swastika? It goes back to millennium ago to India. Meaning peace, basically peace, love, and family. And the Nazis took that symbol, they could have taken a whole bunch of other symbols, you know, as an option, but they took that symbol, uh, symbol to have the meaning it has today. But it's interesting that these, after a few uh, levels of communication with these eighth graders, they get a little preparatory talk on what they think, what the children, what our future think. Real photograph. And I have other photographs here too that I have uh, collected from people that have given them to me from their parents, their father or uncle or grandfather as the case may be, um, when they went into the uh, concentration camp. This is Buchenwald concentration camp. Can you imagine being an 18 year old soldier from Bloomington, Illinois, Tampa, Florida, Los Angeles, whatever, coming from Des Moines, Iowa, and you have to see what you have to see. We're talking about PTSD as we know it today, as my wonderful son-in-law has been deployed many times. He has PTSD. Do you think these gentlemen who are in their 80s and 90s now, they, and we honor them, the liberators are invariably a forgotten group of people in any war. Totally forgotten about the impact that it has on them. And, and the story up here is we're bringing in the, the, the neighborhood people to show them what they were as bystanders. As bystanders. Happy times. There's so much I can share and I'm kind of using available time frame. Shortly after my parents were liberated, they found each other. Dad smiling, big grin. I've inherited that. Um, she's happy. After they got both healthy, it takes, takes a while because mom, when she was liberated from Auschwitz, she was 25 years old, weighed about 90 pounds. The body, various systems shut down, both for men and for women. They had to get healthy again. When they got healthy, I was born. They displaced persons camp, sorry about the butt. 
<laughs> oh, we've all been there changing diapers. I, I'll take this picture. I should say my, my, my youngest grand, grandson now is three months old. So I'm learning that technique again. Yes. Parents married in a relocation camp as well? No, they were married in April of 1940. Uh, um, okay. They were married in April 1940. Uh, and I would, uh, Dad went to a displaced persons camp in Kempton, Germany, which is southwest of Munich, Germany, in the Algoi. It's, it's about 70, 80 clicks, kilometers uh, north northwest of the apex with uh, Austria and Switzerland, beautiful foothills of, of the Alps. It's a four-story building. When you hear a displaced persons camps, they're not like a Y camp or a church camp. Or some camps we hear about in the world today. Um, but that's where Dad settled. Dad was multilingual as well as a physician. He was given a temporary commission, so General Patton's troops coming out of Italy were able to move forward. And that's what they did with local people. This is a violin, obviously. This is my father's violin that's on display at the museum. This is not the same violin that Dad used to afford his way through college and medical school. His family, his parents, he perished, unfortunately. And there's a whole unfortunate story for that because my father saw them walk to their death. Um, that the original violin, again, was destroyed as a result of Allied bombing. He found this violin on, on his way from uh, Dachau, which is a western suburban city of Munich, Germany, to Kempton, which is southwest of that area. And he played that violin to assuage his feelings, not knowing who has lived or died, as the case may be. Um, and uh, a short thing is that my mother found my father. Women have a knack of doing that. <laughs> Let's just look at two, two areas here. This age cohort, 18 to 34. Probably some of our grandkids approaching that or whatever in the family. And uh, my, at least my age group, I won't point fingers elsewhere. Who would want to volunteer a percentage for the bottom number? 18 to 34 year olds that basically deny Holocaust happened. This was a poll done, 54,000 adults. It was an international poll done by Gallup organization five years ago, four years ago. What percentage? It's a percentage. One third of millennials in our wonderful country deny that Holocaust ever happened. Two thirds of millennials cannot name one concentration camp that existed during the Holocaust. I can go on and on with numbers here. I don't have that time. My age grouping, 19%, statistically speaking, denied, and this is international, so take a perspective of the world, the four billion people, whatever in the world, and this is just 54,000 of them. Picture of a couple years ago, person dancing or prancing upon the memorial to 10,000 Lithuanian Jews. Real time, real time, basically. This is six months ago, Southern California. A high school party, it's not a beer pong. I like beer pong. Um, but, oh, I'm sorry. They were taking, they made a Nazi symbol. There's a video, there's voice, you can go online. They're singing Nazi songs in German using the Heil Hitler sign. Six months ago. And I have file folders full of this type of stuff for recent time. The Green Book, some of you, a lot of you may have seen the movie The Green Book. It's like, sort of like the, uh, you know, the uh, AAA trip kit for African Americans in the 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s maybe. Um, and, you know, if you were south of Mason, Dixon Line, east of the Mississippi River. Uh, that's our current, one of our major exhibits we have there is called Beaches, benches, and boycotts about the uh, <coughs> race issues that occurred in St. Petersburg, Florida. This is one small city in the United States. And, and we have had other exhibits there about uh, Jackie Robinson, the first base African-American baseball player. 
Our museum is not a Jewish museum. We're only closed five days a year. Christmas, New Year's, Thanksgiving, Rosh Hashanah, and Yom Kippur. We're open every other day. And we have all forms of, of background. Here we have the artist um, uh, Pachner. It's called Escape. He has like two dozen pictures that he has given our museum. We own that. And it goes down to traveling and exhibits. This is my Samuel Bach. No, I'm sorry, I forget the name of the title of that. <coughs> Very poignant. Gets people to think. These words are not my words, they're from different people. Very poignant. I like the last one the best if I was going to pick one. I have many other sayings. You, we, some people in the room here may have heard of similar sayings. That's it. On the PowerPoint. So I will answer questions that people may have. Yes, ma'am. I'd like to make a suggestion since many people probably in this room live close to the Chicago area. There is a Holocaust yeah, Scopey. Museum. It's called Scopey. Yeah, it's a marvelous one. My first one was St. Petersburg. Okay, yeah. Yeah. Remember, for a handshake, a smile, and a bottle of water, I'll be your dose of there. <laughs> but there's a Greek restaurant like 30 seconds away, too, if you want to talk later. Mm -hmm. Well, I have a number of Jewish friends, and my one friend, um, her family did manage to get out to South America, some to Argentina, and she was born in Cuba. I know Fidel mm -hmm. came but uh, the stories, and they try to be put through the history, is try to get to have them. And she said one aunt was on the St. Louis, and yeah. was lucky, and she had a visa and was able to get to Cuba. What, how, mu how much did our country know, and how soon? A lot. Happen? That's what I thought. A lot. Which is heartbreaking. We all know, most of us know about the MS St. Louis since you mentioned that. That was a ship that left uh, Bremen, Bremenhof in northwest Germany in, I think, March or April of 1939, I think. And they all, everyone on board had visas. This one lady, you're talking, person you're talking about, evidently was able to get in. When he went to Havana, before he got to Havana, Cuba said, we're not going to recognize your visas anymore. They said, no, you can't disembark. You can't get more food or water. The ship pleaded with the United States to help out. I'm not denigrating our country, but it was the times. It's the way it was. And the St. Louis then went to Miami, in Miami Beach. And there's pictures of people that were on the ship that took up the Miami skyline and vice versa. We know that as history, it's fact. The United States would not let them enter. The ship finally had to go back to Bremer and Hoffman. Over half the people perished that were on that ship. 68% as a result of a gallon poll done in 1938 in a wonderful country said that 68% said that they didn't want any more German Jews in this country. Statistically speaking, it was the sign in the times. All right. On my birth certificate, I have a slide which I don't have time to show. On my birth certificate uh, from the displaced persons camp, it's uh, done by the American soldiers. It said religion, Jewish, cool. Nationality, it says German Jew. So it was. That's my birth certificate. Yes, ma'am. I have a friend whose mother was one of the people that was experimented on mm -hmm. uh, during the war by the German doctor. She was in the Alsace and, mm -hmm. and they, his children, do a presentation about their father. And after, um, well, his mother took him to England before the war, after his father had died. And he was adopted by a woman in Michigan who raised him. And he became a Presbyterian minister mm -hmm. and was on the march of Selma. Good. And he felt that since he had been saved, that it was 
important for him to make a difference in civil rights. He paid it forward. He did. He did what it was necessary. Yes. Well, but what was that you did? Yes, sir. Are you familiar with the operation paper clip? Yes. Yeah, that's. Uh, was, was it in Tennessee or Kentucky? I can't remember. Maybe. Was it started in Tennessee or Kentucky? Well, no, it was a movement of the government of the German scientists to the U.S. after the war. Yeah. Most famous one was the work on ground. I think there were a lot of others that were really shady or uh, un <laughs> human experiments that people did right. in that kind of world. Right. Yeah, there was a lot of experimentation, especially on on uh, the twins. <coughs> the rumor was that when a family member had twins, that they purposely tried to separate them, the families in the boxcar. So some other adult would hold the child because that was probably their only chance of survival. So when he left the boxcar, when the train stopped, he left the boxcar and he had to get a bowl of soup, watery soup. So you can have some nutrition. Would you want to be first in line or last in line? When I was at camp or whatever, I was hungrier than everyone else, so I'd be first in line. But what do you think in this circumstance? I'm going to be last. So when we may open a can of soup, we make a, a pot of soup, and it goes into the bowl or it sits in the pot long, what happens to the nutritious part? sinks to the bottom. So you want to be last in line. Things people learned over time, over rumors. And the comment was made that the United States know what's going on. There was, an author, there was a wonderful gentleman who's you know, past president for a couple of years of our, our museum, uh, John Loftus. He's written a few books. He uh, was an FBI special agent and worked at the U.S. Attorney General's office in D.C. And he liked history and he went to Fort Knox and he uncovered a whole bunch of stuff. And he's written quite a few books that are available online, whatever sources, about how the United States knew what was going on already in the late 30s and early 40s. So President Eisenhower, we know, was uh, Commander-in-Chief of AEP Allied Expeditionary Forces in Europe. So one of his great command decisions, in my opinion, was he required that one of the first soldiers in into any camp had to be a photographer. We all in this room probably you know, we understand why. But when I do this, you know, to 12, 13-year-old, 14-year-old students, you know, they have to think about that. They're not used to that type of photography or whatever the case is. But yeah, he made a wonderful command decision among many. The Nazis existed in their government, the executive branch and, and uh, executive branch. Um, they were in the uh, Department of War, they were in the Department of State, um, and in the executive branch from 1938 or 39 till 1952. John Loftus has documented all this history. In 1938, the Nazis held a political gathering in the original Madison Square Garden. 20,000 Nazis protected by the New York City Police Force. So where it was, accepted. You think something like that can happen today? Yeah. You think something yeah. like this is going on in the world today? Mm -hmm. May not be the same numbers. <coughs> There's a different label, different numbers, different countries. And that's why I imbue, especially to the younger generation, the importance. If you see something, say something. That's one of our expressions. If you see something, say something. One of the brochures I have out there, if you're interested, we have what's known as teaching trunks. Florida and Illinois uh, is one is uh, are two of the nine states that require Holocaust education statewide. Only nine states in a wonderful country. Can you imagine that? But anyway, these teaching trunks in Florida, they're, they're free of charge to Florida teachers. They're prepared by uh, certified registered teachers in Florida, the lesson plans, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but if you wanted something here in Illinois or whatever the case is, you would just have to pay for shipping, $150, $200.
and we go from kindergarten to 12th grade. So what do you teach an elementary school student? We teach the concept that difference is okay. Different is okay, because that's all they can understand. That's all they should understand. And in fact, our museum now, we've just been doing primarily, we do about 25, 30,000 sixth graders and 12th graders a year here our museum. And we've got just state authorization and we're working up lesson plans, as I understand. We take from, I think it's uh, third, third graders through fifth graders in a special room that we are developing. So they can have a, their own little mini tour in the museum in this room so they can learn more than just what the teaching trunks can do. And that's what we need to do, in my opinion, given all the craziness that's in the world today. So there is something available for our children and our grandchildren and great grandchildren and, our, and all their prodigies. Other questions, please? Yeah. Sir? I have, yeah, I, have a, I have a friend I worked with a long time uh, who was one of the lost children. Could you tell us, do we know how many of those there I'm were? Sorry, I don't have the answer to that. I don't know. There are tens of thousands. Okay. There are a lot of upstanders, I mean, uh, taking the, maybe the inverse, so to speak. Um, my uncle and aunt survived the war in Shanghai, wonderful city in China. They took a ship in 1938 from Bremerhaven to, uh, to Shanghai. They survived the Japanese um, craziness that occurred there. They also survived the American bombing to reach Shanghai of the Japanese. But there were tens of thousands of Jews who survived. There were two countries in the world that took a stand until the day. One is Bermuda, wonderful place to vacation, came up with a policy document. And the other one was Denmark. The Danish people did not care what flavor of the background of the people of the butcher shop or the bakery or who their neighbors were, etc., etc. And when they heard that the Nazis or knew the Nazis were going to begin to invade their country, they saw what happened in France, Italy, etc. Belgium, is that they used their fishing vessels and transported 95% of the Jewish population to Sweden. Many of those people died as well as the people on the boats. They don't go as that fast. The U-boats loved them as for target practice, but it didn't stop them. They rescued 95% of that of the Jewish population, to say the least. The Nazis were happy, but they took a stand. There's a kinder transport, where it's, um, children's transport, where uh, families would have their children transported by train from Austria and Germany uh, to England, survive the war. And there are many other scenarios. Sir? I have a question on it's, your it's education of young people, what you're doing in out of St. Petersburg. What broad an area are you reaching out to in the state of Florida? All over Florida. All over it's, the it's available. For Florida teachers, everything is free of charge. And how many accepted? How many? Uh, we have a waiting list of about a half a year, if that answers your question. That answers your question. Mm -hmm. I don't know how many trunks we have, but these are old-fashioned big steamer trunks. And elementary grades, they have half the same front size. And the teachers, the lesson plans are all there, and they get documents they can keep, and whatever, just for the asking to get on the list, and, and, and hopefully it, it will work out. And I'm running into our little break time here. I'll be out in the lobby to answer any other questions or talk about our wonderful times here a few decades ago. Thank you so much. <laughs>